So this year, God has really impressed upon my heart a few a few different things, you know, because I think it's important to, as you know, to to take God's word and apply it to our lives today, apply it to uh, our culture and our times, and, and how is that relevant, right, to me? Most people, when they come to church, um, are, are coming with, with, with some type of need, right? And most people, when they dive into the word, are most interested in how does it apply to me? How is this message from 2,000 years ago in the case of the resurrection? Many Old Testament stories, of course, much older than that. How does this apply to my life today? As we go through the word, kind of a general format is we want to see what is in there, right? What is, what is in the text? You know, what's the, the context of, of the study? Right? How, how do I interpret that uh, passage? Uh, and then how does it impl- apply to my life? Right? And I, I love that because the reality is, is, is two different folks, five different folks can study through a passage and there's going to be truths in there. Right? But the application, I believe God uses to kind of put, if you will, the flesh on the message. How does this apply to me today, right, in, in, in the appropriate context of the word, interpreting what the author intended to communicate from the word, how does this apply to me today, and I personally believe that, that God uses his, his spirit to teach us through his word and to apply that individually to our lives, and so, so today we live in, you know, how many times have you heard it said, well, this is really unprecedented time. Right? And then something else happens, and it's more unprecedented right? or more confusing. What we celebrate today changes all of those things. You know, as you know, a few weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C., and, and uh, we were advocating on some insurance issues, my, my day job, if you will. And one of the things that we do is we do a lot of kind of see a lot of the area. And... and um, uh, we were one of the first groups to get into the Capitol, right? It's been closed down for a number, a couple of years for, um, because of the pandemic. And um, in, in the rotunda, right? Throughout Washington, first of all, I couldn't help but be super blessed by the very clear focus as you, as you walk into the monuments, right? That have, that have been here for, for decades of, the, the, the centrality of Christ, the Christian faith, and God's word in the thinking of the founders of our country. You, you can't escape that, right? The, the media might not show it to you, but you can't escape that walking around or, or touring Washington, D.C., right? The, the, the seat of our capital. And we could talk about that for, or the seat of our nation, really, but we talked about that for a long time. But one of the days we were, we were in, in the rotunda, right? We've heard a lot about the rotunda in the last year. Um, and, but throughout the rotunda, there's a number of, of paintings, uh, phenomenal, right? For, for, for those who are, I'm not super artistic, right? Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but but the, the paintings are, are great, and they, they depict impactful times in our nation's history, right? Of course, a, a, a number of, of pictures around the, the revolution, right, around some of the wars with the, with the Indians, around the Civil War, of course, and there's usually a statue of some sort associated with that time frame. And I remember uh, stri- striking up a conversation with one of the security guards and then talking with some of, of my coworkers about what impactful times, right? We, we were in, in this one hallway, and the, 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 from, you walk from the outside into what used to be the, Supreme, the original Supreme Court chambers. And, and the comment was made, this is where, you know, Thomas Jefferson would come in to talk with the, the Supreme Court justices. And you're standing here and thinking, wow, I wonder what, what it was like out these doors, right, at that time. And, and then, and then what, what, what were they talking about? And, and, and impactful times in the, in the history of, of our nation. And they were. And I, and I think, as, as you all know, that we are in very impactful times today. But let me suggest to you, 
as, as impactful as, as you walk around the rotunda, all, all of those points in history are, as impactful as this time is, right? Remember we talked over within the last couple of weeks about if you could choose a time to be alive, right? If you got to kind of step outside of time with the Lord maybe, and you could choose a time to be alive, when would it be? All of the history of the world that you're aware of, right? Most people, a lot of people at the very least, it would either be the time that Christ was on the earth, his earthly ministry, right? And, and perhaps another one of those times would be the time when Jesus Christ returns. I mean, can you imagine? Every now and then you hear Trump and you go, wait, what? I think it's going to be all kind of pretty quick. Like, we're just going to be there. Yeah, I mean, boom, rapture. I mean, twinkling in my eyes pretty fast, right? But certainly we can't choose, but I, I believe we're, we're in one of those two times. And it's not the time when Jesus, his earthly ministry, it's the time when Christ returns. And what a radical time and an awesome time to be alive. Let me suggest to you, though, of all these impactful times in the history of the world, what we celebrate today supersedes all of them. The resurrection of Christ from the dead. That literally changes everything. Right? In, in Revelation chapter 1, right, you're familiar with, with the story. The Apostle John is on the island of Patmos and and he's been there for a long time. They tried boiling him, and, you know what I mean? So they just kind of exiled him to this island. And the Lord himself appears to him. And look with me at what Jesus says, right? Because John did what I'm pretty sure I'm going to do when I stand before the Lord. He, he fell over his dead. I'm pretty sure I'm going to pass out cold, right, for maybe the first 50 years. I, I don't know, for, for a long It's going to be so awesome. Like, and do you ever sit there and just ponder what it's going to be like when... When either we're raptured or, or when you go to be with Jesus. I mean, think about the, the five seconds after your death. I mean, what, what is it going to be like? You ever, you ever ponder that? What, what majesty? What beauty? What glory? What awe? I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stand up. I probably won't. John couldn't. Verse 17 says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. I am he who lives when I was dead. And I am alive. And that's what we celebrate today. Jesus Christ isn't some uh, his, just just some historical figure, although he is a historical figure. But I don't have time today for, for you. I, I'd love to talk apologetics and talk about the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ to dead is perhaps one of the most evaluated times in the history of mankind. And it's irrefutable that Jesus Christ lived, that he died, and he was dead for three days and three nights, as the scripture says and that he rose from the dead. It's really irrefutable, right? What you do with it, that we have a choice. We can't change history. Some people try. You can't change history. But we do have a choice about what we do with it. And that's what I'm, I'm suggesting is that we, we, we consider that, right? Jump with me now kind of to, to answer our question, right? About, you, you know, is Easter the second or third, right? Because some people read that and they go, well, well Steve doesn't know. Other people read it and they go, oh, is he playing around with his words? You know what I mean? It's the first most important holiday. Ch check this out because there's, there's, there's something critical here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul says, Moreover, brethren, in verse 1, I declare to you the gospel. And I, I love that about Paul. Right? Paul was passionate about the good news of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of great things to be passionate about in this life. There's a lot of important causes, right? There's a lot of, you know, I mean, even within the church, a lot of theological things we can discuss. Paul was passionate about the gospel. <laughs> People need the hope of Jesus Christ in their lives. They need the forgiveness of sin. They need the healing power of, of 
the, the Holy Spirit of God living in them and through them. There's a lot of great things we can get into, but I'm going to suggest to you from the scriptures that this is preeminent. This supersedes everything. Why do I say that? Well, because God's word says so. Read with me. The gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Believers today, grasp that. Don't forget that. In which you stand. Now, don't worry, you're, I'm standing, you're seated. Don't worry about it. You know, the idea is that you're in the gospel. You're, you're in Christ is the idea. And, and if you think about all that that means, right? This is my beloved son, God the Father spoke when Jesus was baptized. In him I am well pleased. Listen to him. He is well pleased with Jesus and, and as believers in Christ, once we've come to that place where we've received Christ as our Savior, we, we, we have accepted the forgiveness that he so freely offers. When he looks at us, he sees Jesus, the perfection of Jesus. That's the idea of being in Christ, the good news, the gospel in which you stand. I was thinking this week and listening to a, a, a message about the time when, when Jesus was on the cross, right, and... and the, 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 the wrath of God being poured upon him. And, and it says that he became sin so that we could be forgiven. It doesn't say that, that he, um, that, that like, it, it talks about that he became sin, Right? He became sin. Think about that for a minute. When God the Father was looking at him, he saw the sin of humanity and the wrath that I deserved, that we all deserve, was poured upon him. He became sin. When he looked at Jesus, he saw sin and the wrath of God was poured upon that so that today when he looks at you, he can see Christ and not your sin. That's good news. And that's what the Apostle Paul preached. That was, that was the focus of his ministry. The, the, the forgiveness and the healing power that is in Christ. He said, which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. He says, verse 3, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. So this isn't Paul's message. This is Christ's message through his vessel, the Apostle Paul. It's a message that Paul received like we receive it, and he communicated it to a lost and hurting world. And, he's, and, and uh, some of your translations, right, I delivered to you uh, first of all, or the, the idea is of, of foremost importance. This is top priority. This is the most important thing. And he lists three specific things, and there's a fourth thing that ties them together. He says, number one, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. You're going to find that little phrase, according to the scriptures, ties all these things together, which is important. He died for you. Not just that he died, right? A lot of Animals had been sacrificed and died. A lot of people have died, right? The statistics are pretty overwhelming. Everybody dies, right? But he died for our sins. You think of the agony. Many people didn't even make it through, through the beating that, that Jesus took. You know, but he willingly went to the cross to, to pay the price for all of our sins. So that as God the Father looked upon the sin of the world on his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And he, he, he poured his wrath, he poured the punishment for sin upon his son so that when he looked upon you, he could see Christ. And all we have to do is receive that truth, believe that truth by faith, right? He died for our sins. He didn't have to. You think of the agony that he went through. 
that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried. This is important, right? He was buried, as the scripture said, the Messiah would be for three days and three nights. He was, he was, he was buried and, and, and in a tomb. And then, oh, the beautiful thing, right, that we celebrate today, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Why, why, why is it in part so important that he was buried? So that he could rise from the dead, right? He was there for three days and three nights, removing any doubt, right? You, I mean, it's almost comical, I won't get too far into it, to, to think of some of the theories that have been proposed to overcome the fact that Jesus died and rose and that there was more than 500 witnesses who saw him alive, right? You know, some suggesting that the Roman soldiers who were professional executioners, didn't, he wasn't actually dead. They were mistaken. Some suggesting that there was an identical twin, right, that nobody knew about until after Jesus died, and that's who went around doing all these things afterwards, right? It's preposterous, right? But, but, but it, to a degree, it really it, it, it further proves a point that Jesus Christ did die and that he did rise because, in, in fact, there are so many ideas trying to make an excuse for the reason that they're, he's walking around after he had clearly died, right? And so he, and, and he rose from the dead the third day, according to the scriptures, and then, this, and then the word goes on and, and, of course, speaks about that. Why is, why is the resurrection so important? It separates Christianity from every other religion, right? There's all sorts of different religious systems out there. There's all sorts of different thinking about, you know, life and death and eternity and, nothingness, or whatever the case may be. But the fact that Jesus Christ said that he would rise, and that he did rise, and it was witnessed by so many people, separates Christianity from all others. It's really the central truth of the Christian faith is that the, our Messiah rose from the dead, showing power over death. Really, the resurrection and the importance of it can't be overstated. In him, we have new life, right? When, when, we, when someone comes to faith in Christ, we, we encourage, according to the scriptures, to be baptized, right? And, and, and baptism is really a public expression of an inward commitment. You're not saved by baptism. You know, if you commit your life to Christ and get hit by a car on the way home and die, you're not going to hell, right? Because you weren't baptized, right? But, but Jesus does tell us to be baptized. And so, but the, it's a beautiful picture of, of, of being buried, if you will, in the water, right? Our old life, our sinful life, dead and rising again in newness of life in Christ. And what we celebrate today, the resurrection of Christ, the, the power over death. Really, it's central. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Many, right, have set out to disprove the resurrection. And guess what? Many become Christians. Because you, 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 it, it's irrefutable, the fact that Jesus lived, that he died, and that he rose again. If anybody wanted to uh, uh, dis discredit Christianity, they, they could try to prove that. But like I said, many have tried, and they're not successful. The common thread, though, throughout this is that it was done according to the scriptures. Right? God's word, right? It, it, it's so important that um, our, our theology, our thinking, our conduct, the way that we interact with people, the way that we relate to the Lord is done according to the scriptures. Right? Paul says this preeminent fact, this preeminent thing that Christ died for your sins, that he was buried and that he, was, that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures, this changes everything. Jump with me real quick over to uh, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Sometimes we feel like, you know, as, as we walk this, this walk of faith, as we pursue Christ, we do our best to live for him every day. 
if we're honest, we fall short. Right? If, if we're honest, we, we hurt at times. Right? If, if we're honest, we realize that we're really not everything that our social media pages try to promote us to be. Right? If we're honest, sometimes we feel like God might be far from us. That's why it's important that, that our thinking is according to the scriptures. Check out what the Apostle Paul tells us here in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, because we were, right, in our, in our trespasses and sin, right? You once were, who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So when we feel like God is distant, is he? Right, we've been brought near, not by our good works, but by the blood of Christ. Now, oh, we can let things get in between us, right? We, we can impact the way we feel, the way we think. But it's important to come back to these truths that you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, right? Those things that separated us from the Lord, namely sin, God has broken down that wall, right? And he has, he has brought under one banner, Jew and Gentile alike, right into the church of Jesus Christ. And, and that changes everything. He has broken down this wall. He, is, he himself is our peace. Let me encourage you. People need Jesus. People need to be pointed to Jesus. People need Today, in our, in our confused culture, and we could go on and on about that, in, in our challenged culture, in our, our sort of wayward, not sort of, in our very wayward culture, people need the <laughs> solid foundation, the cornerstone, the anchor of our souls, Christ, and, and they need to be pointed to him. In John chapter 15 and verse 13, <coughs> right, we read that greater love, has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Many have laid down their lives right, for, for their friends, for their countrymen, for, for other people. Christ Jesus laid down his life so that we can be forgiven of our sin. He was the only perfect sacrifice, right? So the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central and most important event in human history. Right? What else could possibly supersede that? And it does change everything. Secondly, we are going to go to a passage that we, we often uh, celebrate at, at, or we often review at Christmas. Jump with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. What I, what I want to make a case for here and, and encourage you in is that the, the, so, so we've established that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ it is the, the, the central and most important event in human history. And that's a bold statement, but I would, I would be interested to hear anybody who argued otherwise. Right? It changes everything. And I'm going to suggest, secondly, that the extent to which we yield to and pursue him. Right? Because we, we do have a choice to make in that matter. Right? We get to choose the extent to which we yield to Jesus, right? The extent to which we pursue Jesus. And it's just honest to understand that someone can be saved and not pursuing Christ with all of their heart, right? Now, that's just a reality, right? No, nobody's perfect in this life. If someone puts on the facade that they are, right, know that it's that, it's a facade. Nobody's perfect. And so the extent to which we pursue and yield to him it drives our purpose and peace. And, and read with me in, in Isaiah chapter 9, right? Certainly a very troubling time for the nation of Israel and the people of Israel, right? A time of, of war, a time of confusion, a time of fear for many. But in verse 6, we read hope, right? And we talked about this a minute ago. For unto us a child is born. We celebrate that at Christmas, right? You're, the sea is capitalized. It's speaking of Christ. Right, a child is born, unto us a son is given. Right, he was born on mission. 
He was born with a purpose. Unto us a son is given, and, and, it, and listen to this, the government will be upon his shoulders. The government will be upon his shoulders. The idea here is the rule, right, right the authority, right, the, the responsibility, the, literally his, the providence. It's speaking of the providence of God, right, literally foresight, right? It, it's the way that God directs the affairs of mankind largely by second-hand causes, right? He doesn't force us as robots, but he can very strongly influence us, can't he? Have you ever, and this is a rhetorical question, I know you have, but you've ever looked at the circumstances in life and you go, I think God's speaking to me, <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe you haven't read something in the Word that, like, jumped off the page at you about that. I, I like it when that happens, right? Maybe God hasn't, uh, he, he probably, honestly, he probably has spoken to your heart by the time the circumstances get so clear, but maybe you haven't listened. Maybe, just possibly. I, I know I do that sometimes, right? <clears throat> God works in our lives many times by means of secondary causes, right? He doesn't force us to do something. That's the idea here. And it's, and it's interesting, right, the government, and of course, they're, they're, will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And check this out. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So there's clearly an application Right, in, 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 in time, in the thousand-year reign, right, when he'll be the, the ruler, literally the ruler of the earth. But then, of course, on into eternity. Right? I, now, that's going to be awesome. Right? It's, it's interesting to me that at the end of the thousand-year reign, right, people complain. It doesn't matter who's in office. People complain about the government. Right? And you know, Ronald Reagan, who was president, governor, you know, he said some of the most frightening words in, in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So regardless of who's in power, right, there, there, there's challenges with uh, self-rule, right? I think uh, uh, if it's done in an integral way, right, it's, it's the best form of government, right? But there's challenges with, with any form. And so, um, but, but the reality is here is that uh, he, even at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, when the government truly is perfect, right, Jesus Christ is going to be the one in charge. People will still choose to follow Satan. Right? In fact, he lets them loose for a short season to just show the heart of man at the end of the day, right? And so, um, but we, there, there's clearly an, an application in that regard. But of the increase of his government and peace, how many people today do you know that are looking for peace? I remember when I got saved, you know, I was, I was I, you know, I, I had, my life wasn't terrible by any means. But I remember talking with a buddy of mine that I, I had, uh, uh, well, he, he was here a while ago. He, thankfully, he didn't tell too many crazy stories. But, um, you know, we had, we had gotten into some trouble together. We gotten into a few things. And, and um, we we're on the phone, and I was going to this retreat. You know, I'm like, 90 bucks for two nights in the mountains, and all your meals are covered? I mean, yeah, it's with the church, but that's a good deal. I mean, this is like 35 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. Anyways. You know, and, and, and I, I told him, I go, you know, I don't, I don't care about all this born again. I won't use the same language that I used at the time. But, like, um, I, I just want to find peace, right? And, and things were bad. I mean, I had, I had a good job. I, you know, uh, lived near the beach, I think, at the time. And um, just a lot of, a lot of from a, a worldly perspective, things <coughs> were, were relatively good. But I just wanted to find peace. And here we, we see, and I did. Here we receive, the, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Let me suggest to you, you can have as much of God's peace. You can have as much of Jesus as you'll give him, as you'll allow him to have. He won't force himself on you. Right, so there's a very real way that by the providence of God in our lives, regardless of the insanity around. And, and, I, and I told you, I'm, I've had a pretty dim view of, of the future of our nation, and I've told you how God has specifically rebuked me. And I don't know how it's going to go, right? Revival or, or complete destruction. 
right? I'm praying for a revival. I'm not going to give on it. But, I mean, the day after, I think I shared this, the day after I, I taught about, you know, the sad state of where things are, God specifically rebuked me in a commentary, right, and studied his word on, on how, how, how dare we give up hope. Is anything too big for God, even saving where we are today? But regardless of what happens with our nation or with the world, there's a personal application to this, right? Of the increase of his government and his peace, right? For our individual lives, there is no end. The choice is how much do we want to yield to him? How much do we trust him? Interesting to think about. You see, the truth is this. There's more fear in our nation than, than perhaps ever before, right? At least in our lifetimes. No question about it. More fear in the world, and, and for good reason, right? There's all sorts of challenges. We won't, we won't get into all those. But at the end of the day, right, in, in our culture, as we looked around, we have lost, we've lost our soul. We, we've lost our mooring, as I heard, it, I heard it put this week. We've lost that anchor of truth, right? And once you let go of the dock and you're on a rudderless ship in a storm, it is frightening. And that's sort of where our country is today. But I heard something that challenged me tremendously. Have you ever considered the reality that we are but one decision away from revival in our country. Some people automatically go, you're out of your mind. You, you haven't read the Bible. You don't know how it ends up. Oh, I, I have. I know, how, I know how ultimately it goes. I don't know how it goes for our country, neither do you. Right? The, the reality is we are one decision away. How many times in the history of the nation of Israel were they at rock bottom? You read the book of Judges up and down. And when, when they truly repented, and when I say they, does it mean that every single person in the nation repented? No. Right? But there was a group, often starting with a leader, who said, enough. We need to get back to the ways of the Lord. And th those individuals set the example, and they pursued the Lord, they adjusted their thinking. They adjusted their life. And based on that truth, when they made that decision, how long did God continue to punish them? How long did God say, oh, you know what? I think you need a little more time. Not long. How long does it take for God's grace to kick in? Think about that. Just, just ponder that this week. We're one decision away from revival. One decision away. And that doesn't mean that everybody's going to come to Jesus. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden our nation is going to be the beacon of hope and light that it, that it has been for so long. But it does mean that there is hope. And, and God forbid we ever give up hope. Right? There, there's some that have. I've, I've heard well-meaning Christians that I, I love very much say, you know what, the Lord's coming back so quickly, we should just button up the hatches and wait. That is anti-biblical thinking. And, and, and I know this person loves the Lord. Right? Genuinely. But the idea that we should just give up, God forbid. But the reality is, is that at, at first and foremost, we have to have our soul anchored, right? As, as individuals hook our, our rope to the foundation of Christ. Let, let our ship be anchored. As some of us should start perhaps, as, me, as for me and my house, as Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. At the end of the day, I don't really care. I mean, I do care what happens to our nation. But I don't care. I'm going for the Lord regardless of what everybody else does. Right? And I know, I know you're here because you are too. Right? But God forbid that, that we give up hope or that we portray that there's no hope to the world. The world needs hope. Right? The world needs hope. And, and the hope is in the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? A lot of people, I was thinking on this this week, a lot of people sort of just accept their life. They don't, you, you know, you hear people talk about leading. What, what kind of life do you lead, right? The idea that, that we're really driving the decisions, that we're really thinking things through, and that we're, we're following a path or a plan for our life. A lot of people don't lead their life. They accept their life. 
They just sort of whatever happens, happens. Right? Leading our life, right, is, is uh, if we want to lead our life, that implies intentionality. Intentionally drawing near to the Lord. Does anybody just feel like getting up in the morning early and spending time in prayer and reading the word, right, every single day without fail? Right? Don't, don't raise your hand because we'll know you're lying, right? Nobody automatically feels like that. But a lot of people make that decision, right? That's being intentional, right? A lot of people aren't intentional about their pursuit of Christ. The reality is, is, is you hear, oh, it's an uphill battle, right? In fact, we, we know the important truth Peter taught us, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That word casting has the idea of you, you kind of have to keep on doing it, casting a ball uphill. And the reality is, right, to go uphill, you have to be intentional. And many times you're going to go alone, and it's going to be a struggle. But it's worth it. The beautiful thing about going uphill is the scenery gets better, right? And so jump with me over to Psalm 72. I, I hope that this uh, uh, encourages is some of us today to, to realize that when we feel like there's no hope, we're, we're not alone, but we shouldn't allow, I'm sorry, Psalm 73, that we shouldn't allow ourselves to stay there. The psalmist says here in verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Right? And if you find yourself today without a pure heart, right, get before the Lord and, and ask him to clean it up. Right? The Apostle Paul tells us that love believes all things. Right? And does that mean that if someone tells me the sky is orange that I automatically look outside and they go, it looks great. But I believe all things. So the idea is that love believes the best. Do you honestly believe the best? I don't know about you, right? That, that's sort of a rhetorical question too, right? That's not our natural tendency, but Paul tells us love believes the best, right? Truly God is good to such as have a pure heart. Let God purify and cleanse your heart, right? Know that God is good. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Right? So the psalmist is telling us, man, he almost gave up. I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And this is, this is his perspective, right? This is how it seems. For there were no pains in their death. There no pain, right? Their, their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men. For time's sake. So he looks at all the things that we can tend to look at in, in, in what we might call people in the, in the world or even others around us, believers, right, that, that we think life is just smooth for them. And he had almost lost his footing as a result of at, at looking at how it seems so good for these folks, but not for me. But look what he says in verse 17. Well, verse 16, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful and, you know, you ever like, I can't even wrap my mind around that, right? Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Until he went into the presence of the Lord. Right? And that changes everything for us, brothers and sisters. That changes everything for us. In Matthew chapter 11, you know, in fact, let's jump over there real quick. Matthew chapter 11. This is a message that the world needs, right? We, we, we can get distracted. I get distracted, right? We can get distracted on things that aren't of the foremost importance, right? Matthew chapter 11, he says, Come to me, Jesus, speaking, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Anybody you know need rest for their soul? Anybody you know need some peace in their lives? The answer is, is found in what we, what we celebrate today. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. The extent to which we yield uh, and, and yield to and pursue him really drives our purpose and our peace. And then last but not least, Right, at the end of the day, right, the, the reasonable conclusion, the natural conclusion is that what you do with Jesus Christ is the most important decision we'll make. 
right, what we choose to do with Jesus Christ, first and foremost, right, in terms of our relationship with him, first and foremost uh, among everything else is coming to acknowledge the fact that he is who he said he was and that he did what he said he would do, right, that he would pay the price for our sins, that he would die to do that, that he would rise a third day, and that now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for those who trust in him. Right? Jesus Christ paved the way. The idea is, are we going to walk on it? Are, are we going to receive that forgiveness? That's first and foremost. And then, and that, that's a point in time decision, but really pursuing Christ is a daily decision, isn't it? Hourly, <laughs> minutely maybe. Right? What we do with Jesus, right? Well, there's a lot of choices we have what to do with Jesus. Outright reject him, that's a choice. Not a good one, by the way, but it's a choice. People have the option to reject Jesus. As believers, we have the option to reject certain things from his word. Right? Pe believers do that. Well-intentioned believers, like the brother who said, oh, just button up the hatches and wait for the Lord to come. You know, that's not God's heart. In John 17, Jesus prayed. Father, I, I, pray, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Meaning he empowers us to do that. We can sort of be standoffish. We can sort of appease Jesus, right? Oh, yeah, he was a good teacher. He was a moral man. Well, it, it, if you reject the reality of him being God, how can you say he's a moral man or a good teacher? Right, if you reject, because he claimed to be God, right, and so if, if if we reject that truth, there's only two other options: either he knows he's not God and he's claiming to be, which would make him be a liar, so that wouldn't be a good moral teacher, right? Or he's not God, but he thinks he is, and that would make him cuckoo, right? Like the guy that used to walk around the Orange Mall when I was a kid, we used to make fun of him, right? And he thought he was Jesus, you know. And so not, I'm not advocating making fun of him, but in my younger years, and so. Um, um, anyways, right, so so th there's choices that we have. Some choose to sort of put it off. Well, I'll think about Jesus, you know, when I'm older, right? Some, some just sort of, you know, delay. It, or, or what I would suggest, embrace Jesus. Surrender to Jesus. Let that be our manner of, li of living. Right, it, it's, it's interesting to me, jump with me over to Luke chapter 24, Right, we're almost, uh, as I heard one preacher this week say, we're rounding third base. Of course, he had another like 30 minutes to go or something like that. But <laughs> when a preacher says it in closing, that doesn't mean what you think it means. But we are, we are getting close. Um, so, so it's really an ongoing decision, but, but it starts with surrender. And, and, it, and it requires surrender. Interesting, the course of course... Uh, uh, Luke 24, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, uh, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen, right, as we celebrate today. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee and uh, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise. And they remembered his words, right? And they returned from the tomb, so the ladies did, and they told these things to the eleven uh, and to all the rest. It was Mary Magd uh, Magdalene, uh, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And then check this out, verse 11, and their words seemed to them as idle tales. Idle talk. And they didn't believe them. God forbid that should be true of us. Right? God forbid that, that you know, there's a lot of idle talk in the world, right? There's a lot of, a lot of idle talk among well-meaning people, right? But it, it seemed like idle talk. But let me, let me suggest to you, what was happening here was the central, what would become the central event in their faith. Jesus Christ. Right? Why do you search for the living among the dead? Jesus has rose from the dead, and that changes everything. You know, so, some people have great intentions, right? really great intentions, either about 
I'll surrender to Jesus someday. Or even those who give their life to Jesus and say, I'll, I'll get more serious about it someday. Right, good, good intentions. May I suggest to you, whether it's in your faith, whether it's in your career, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in a community organization at some point, good intentions are way, way overrated, aren't they? Good actions, that means something. Good decisions, that means something. Good intentions are way overrated. Nothing good really happens until you have good actions. Once I've surrendered, then what? What do I do day to day? Real quick, jump with me. Right, finish last words real quick. Over to Philippians. Right, you can go back and sort of dig, dig a little deeper on some of these things. But uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2. You know, what, what do I do? How, how do I live out this faith? I, Steve, I, I, I accept the fact that this is the, the cornerstone of Christianity. Jesus Christ. His resurrection changes everything for me. I want to live it out passionately. I want to be impactful. I want to be fruitful for the kingdom of God. What does that mean to me? How do I, how do, I do that? Philippians 2, verse 1, Therefore, if there be is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy, Paul says, by being like-minded. How can we be like-minded? By, by serving the same God, diving into his word according to the scriptures. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, check this out, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind or humility, right? Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. You want to pursue Jesus with all your heart? Bless other people. Reach out to other people love on other people, meet them where they're at, prefer them over yourself, serve others, add value to others. We, we have in our, in our society sort of a time, whether it's kind of throughout maybe our careers, we get to maybe a position where we think, oh, I've kind of got it made. Maybe it's retirement. Maybe it's a, a, a season of a, of a break or vacation where like, you know, I can just sort of relax now. I've kind of got it made. Right? We're not really supposed to get to that place where we just don't add value to others. Right? We got all the rest we need in heaven. <laughs> right? You know, continue to add value to others, right? Paul lays out, I mean, in four verses, beautiful outline for a life well lived. <clears throat> right? And this is regardless of whether we're just getting started in early stages of, of life right, in, in school or getting out of school or on into our career or maybe advancing in our career or maybe through with our career, right, regardless, serve others, add value to others, bless others. And then last but not least, almost, <laughs> uh, turn, turn with me over to Titus. Titus chapter 2, pick up in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who did what? Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special, special people, zealous for good works. There we go again. That idea of, of blessing others, loving on others. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one despise you. Keep your eyes looking out for Jesus. He is coming again, right? I, I, I love that truth, right? And, and that is, as we read here, the, the, the blessed hope, right? We, we read what Paul's focus was, right? Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose from the dead, according to the scriptures. And, and because of his finished work on the cross for us, we now have opportunity for a relationship with him and a life well lived of purpose and love and peace in him. In, in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, I, 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 call, I like reading uh, 
Peter's letters, Peter was sort of impetuous. He kind of put his foot in his mouth from time to time. I, I'm kind of like that, right? So I call this Elder Peter after a, a life, you know, of, of experience. I love listening to people who have lived life well, right? And, and or even not well, right? But just learning from their, their, their lives. And Peter says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Do you have cares this morning, concerns this morning, fears this morning, doubts? Cast those on the Lord. He loves you. He is for you. He is our peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there is no end. In other words, we can have as much as we're willing to allow him to give to us. I suggest give him all. Amen? Let's stand.